Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues joining us virtually. Good morning. We at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESM, are very happy that you could join us today virtually at the global launch of the 2020 United Nations e-government survey. As you may know, the e-government survey is a biennium flagship publication of UNDESA that over the last 10 editions has established itself as both a leading benchmarking reference on e-government and the policy tool for decision makers. It is a privilege to have with us the United Nations and the Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, Mr. Liu Zhenmin, to deliver his keynote address at the global launch. We're also delighted to have on the panel of presenters and discussants, Mr. Vincenzo Aquaro, Chief of the Digital Government Branch in the Division of Public Institutions and Digital Government, UNDESA, Ms. Lamia Mubayed Bissa, Member of the United Nations Committee of Experts on Public Administration, and Ms. Julia Glidden, Corporate Vice President for Microsoft Worldwide Public Sector. You may find their bios online on a shared link. Before we begin, I'd like to kindly ask you to turn off your microphones when you're not speaking. I'd like to also mention that this event is organized on WebEx platform, but we also have many joining us through UN TV webcast or Facebook Live. All attendees will have an opportunity to ask questions in chat box of Facebook Live. We will address your questions during our follow-up webinar series organized throughout the next two weeks for more detailed and technical discussions of the survey findings. The date, time, and the links of webinars are available online on our webpage. Now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to the Under Secretary General, Mr. Liu Zhenmin, to deliver his keynote address. Under Secretary General, over to you, please. Thank you, thank you, Alpin. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all colleagues and friends from around the world, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to join you in this global launch of the 2020 United Nations e-government survey. Today, we are launching the 11th edition of the e-government e e survey. But this luncheon is special as it, as it is taking place during an unprecedented global crisis. COVID-19 pandemic is presenting enormous and far-reaching challenges to humankind, to countries, governments, and to businesses. The international community and the leadership of the United Nations and the World Health Organization is working hard to address the challenges. This includes through digital solutions and the innovative ways to preserve and ensure business continuity. Indeed, Adversity and opportunity are two sides of the same coin. It is in this setting that the 2020 e government survey unveils developing the trends of digital government around the world. It shows how countries are pivoting and innovating to meet new challenges and support the sustainable development goals. The e government survey is widely recognized by digital ministers, national chief information officers, as well as other policymakers and the researchers in public administration and information and communication technology. Now, in its 11th edition, the survey is an invaluable data set built over the past 20 years, providing insights of development trends. It has become an important ranking, mapping, and measuring tool for countries in pursuing digital government. Like many UN publications, the 2020 e-government survey is a result of collective team effort. I extend my appreciation to many partners and experts and volunteers who have contributed to the survey in one way or the other. The survey also benefited from close collaboration with the various UN agencies and offices, including 
UN Regional Commissions, United Nations University, United Nations Human Settlement Program, UN Habitat. I also acknowledge the valuable contribution of data resources from ITU and UNESCO. I also extend a special thanks to the following partners who have committed to translate the survey into other UN official languages. The Telecommunication Regulatory Authority of the United Arab Emirates for the Arab, Arabic edition, the China National Academy of Governance for the Chinese edition, the Ministry of Digital Development, Innovations, and Aerospace Industry of Kazakhstan for the Russian edition, and the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina, for the Spanish edition. Colleagues, I will now share some insights on the key findings of the 2020 UN e-government survey. At the outside, I would like to note that much of the work of the survey, particularly the data collection, review, and analysis was done before the COVID-19 had emerged. It is for this reason that the survey follows its usual pattern, data presentation and the thematic chapters, but with an addendum that specifically addresses the impact of the pandemic. And while well, we view everything now naturally through the lens of the pandemic, I invite you to join me for the next few minutes and do what the survey does. Step back and consider its assessments first, followed by the overlay of how COVID-19 has interacted with the digital government. I will start with the development trends at the global, regional, and the local level, and then share some findings in three thematic areas on e-participation, data governance, and the digital capacity, respectively. First on global trends. Globally, the 2020 survey highlights a persistent positive trend towards higher levels of digital government development. This is seen in how the survey tracks the progress of a digital government of all 193 UN member states through the established e-government development index or EGDI. More than 65% of member states, it means that 126 countries have fared very well with a high and a very high e-government development index levels. Over 20%, it means 42 countries recorded upward movements from lower to higher levels of e-government development. This positive progress is visible even in countries in special situations and those with limited resources. Well, e-government rankings tend to correlate with the income level of a country, financial resources are, are not the only critical factor in advancing digital government. As we observe in the survey, very often a country's political vision strategic leadership and the commitment to advanced digital services can improve its comparative ranking. Close to 80% of countries offer digital services for use, women, elder persons, persons with disabilities, migrants, and poor people, reflecting the vision of the 2030 agenda to leave no one behind. Second, on regional development. Regional development follows the global trend, with all five regions making improvements in e-government. It is reassuring to note that despite the challenges faced in the African region, there has been a significant uptake in e-government development. Only seven out of 54 countries in Africa remain in the lowest e-government group. As a developed tool, survey pays special attention to countries in special situations. 
according to the survey, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Cambodia have become the leaders in digital government development among the least developed countries. In Africa, we see Mauritius, Seychelles, and South Africa take the lead. At the same time, the, 20, the 2020 survey revealed that digital government divides exist within and between regions, despite the overall advancement globally. Well, Asia and America's regions are closely compar comparable in their digital development overall. The gaps among countries in Asia are wider. Gaps are also seen among countries in Africa and in Latin America and the Caribbean. There has also been an increase in regional initiatives and partnerships with a strategic focus in digital government, especially those led by the United Nations regional commissions and other intergovernmental bodies, such as the African Union and the European Union. These initiatives range from digital economy, digital trade, open government and open data, user-centric evaluation of digital initiatives, disaster risk mitigation efforts, and large-scale digitalization of public sector functions. Adoption of digi strategic digital policies and implementation plans at the national and the regional levels are among recent policy initiatives. Such initiatives demonstrate the importance of regional cooperation and the relevance of digital transformation efforts. They are geared towards specific regional development challenges, but also towards the common goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Third, on local e-government development. I mean, look, look at it. broad global regional trends. Let us go local. The role of local government is undeniable, and the people interact daily and directly, and often identify more with their local authorities. The assessment of local municipal governments, first highlighted in 2018, has extended its scope from 40 to 100 municipalities across the world in 2020. Findings show that. A city's digital government development does not necessarily mirror that of its national development. With the ex exception of the top ranked cities, local governments generally underperform as compared to their national head portals. Most city portals are still offering very basic features information provision and not service provision. The survey calls for a shared vision of local digital government involving all relevant stakeholders. Incentives could encourage local businesses, including micro, small, and medium enterprises, to participate as partners in developing innovative smart city projects. Force on e participation. Dear colleagues, we now look deeper into some semantic areas of digital government. First semantic area is on participation. A key dimension of governance and one of the pillars of sustainable development. The survey shows that e-participation platforms have continued to spread in more countries. But the trend is towards multi-function participation platforms, such as consultations or e-petition on new policies, opinion surveys, complaint systems, reports of corruption, and the sharing of ideas. It is not always clear that these online platforms have translated into broader participation. In many cases, the take up of the e-participation remains low. It is important to be clear 
on the objectives of e-participation activity to pay attention to the institutional processes of e-participation, such as how e-participation is affecting the public trust in institutions, the internet, and social media, and establishing clear linkages between e-participation activities and the formal decision-making processes. Second semantic area is data. There has been a dramatic change of government data in recent years. In its collection, use, security, and exchange supported by new technologies and the new forms of functions of data. The promise to move away from gut instinct policymaking has prompted many governments to deploy data governance frameworks and data-centric strategies. The aim is to generate public value and drive sustainable development. The survey concludes that optimizing the use of government data will make public institutions more productive, accountable, and inclusive in line with the principle of reflected in SDG 16. The data-centric government will also help build public trust and strengthen trustworthiness. But many benefits around government data have yet to be realized, especially in countries in special situations. They face barriers like uh, a lack of understanding of data and data science, absence of data leadership, resource constraints, and concerns about data quality, security, and privacy. Harvesting public data, ha harvesting public value from data, therefore, requires long-term approach. It must involve mastery the economics and the politics of data governance and manage and effectively manage data security and privacy issues. The third thematic area is the digital transformation. The 2020 survey also looks at the capacities for digital transformation as a fundamental pillar to government transformation in support of SDGs. Unfortunately, many countries still lack the capacities to effectively leverage digital technologies to provide reliable, secure, and inclusive services and empower people through open and participatory mechanisms. The survey concludes that digital government transformation is itself value-driven. It requires institutional support across all government levels and societies. Let's, let me now come to the last point, the fifth point, um, COVID-19 response. And uh, dear colleagues, as I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, a special agenda on COVID-19 pandemic is included in the COVID-19 in the 2020 survey, a study uh, to study the societal impacts of the pandemic, the role of digital government, and the equity dimensions. Increasing, interestingly, the pandemic has renewed and anchored the role of digital government, both in its conventional delivery of digital services as well as new innovative efforts in managing the crisis. Other than sharing information online, digital government tools have also enabled government to make rapid policy decisions based on real-time data and analytics, enhance the capacities of local authorities for better coordination and deploy evidence-based services. During the pandemic, Governments quickly implemented dedicated COVID-19 portals, organized hackathons 
with the non-governmental institutions targeting the virus. Implemented e-services for supply of medical goods for virtual doctors, self-diagnosis apps, and e-permits for curfews. And quickly deployed tracking and tracing apps and the apps for working and the learning from home. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, digital transformation is now a critical part of the national sustainable development for many countries. And the accelerated phase of digital transformation during COVID-19 is a silver lining. The world community will need to remain steadfast, constantly innovating even during difficult times. As the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, the post-COVID-19 world will be different and much more digital than before. My department, UNDESA, will remain fully committed to supporting digital government and sustainable development. Let, me, let us move forward, work together for a new digital normal in a decade of action for sustainable development. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Under Secretary General. I would like to now invite Mr. Vincenzo Acquaro, Chief of the Digital Government Branch, DPIDG UNDESA, to share with us the key findings of the 2020 e-government survey. Mr. Acquaro, over to you, please. Thank you, Madam. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, as Chief of Digital Government Branch of DPIDG, it's also my great honor and privilege to be here today to launch worldwide the e-government survey 2020. Almost all my presentation will draw on global and regional mega trends on digital transformation. I will also introduce some insight from the addendum to illustrate how digital government has been playing a central role, not only in responding to the COVID-19 crisis, but also for recovery and development. At a glance, the 2020 survey reflects further improvement in global trends in e-government development and the transitioning of many countries from lower to higher GDI levels. In this edition, 57 countries have a very high GDI values in comparison with 40 countries in 2018. A total of 69 countries have high AGDI values and 59 countries have a middle AGDI. Only eight countries have low AGDI value compared to the 16 countries in 2018. With 34 new entrants, there are now 126 member states in the high and very high AGDI that is the 65% of all member states. This denotes a significant improvement in the level of e-government development around the world. The survey highlights a persistent positive global trends toward higher level of e-government development. This map shows the countries that have moved from one AGDI group to another since 2018. 42 countries recorded positive upward movement from a lower AGDI group to a higher one. 18 countries moved from the high to the very high group. 16 moved from the middle <clears throat> to the high group. And eight moved from the low to middle group. In Africa, 15 countries transitioned from a lower to a higher AGDI group. In America, nine countries. 11 countries in Asia, and seven in Europe. The global average AGDI value continued to rise, reaching 0.60 in 2020 in comparison with 0.55 in 2018. All the regions have improved their average AGDI, contributing on an increase to digital development worldwide. It is worthy to notice that Africa and Oceania made the notable progress, having increased their AGDI value by 14%. Europe remained the leader in the government development with an average AGDI 
value of 0.82. All countries in Europe have a GDI value above the global average. For the first time, Asia uh, has the second higher regional GDI value, followed by Americas, Oceania, and Africa. Despite the significant progress made in Oceania and Africa, these two regions uh, and uh, their regional AGDI average remain below the global average. In this report, uh, for the first time, the ranking was also supplemented by rating classes, further analysis of countries grouped according to four equally defined intervals identified by the first, the second, and the third quartile. To gain better insight into countries with similar level of performance, each of the four AGDI groups were further divided into 16 rating classes. As for AGDI methodology, in analyzing the result, it is important to bear in mind that the slight differences in AGDI values between countries do not necessarily imply that the country with the lower score has underperformed in compare with the other countries with a higher score, nor does a higher GDI value imply better performance, especially among the countries with the same rating class. Therefore, analysts and policymakers should be cautioned against misinterpreting slight changes in ranking among countries with the same rating class. Every country should strategize the level and extent of uh, its digital government objective based on its specific national development context, capacity, strategies, rather than on arbitrary assumption of its future position in the ranking. The GDI is a powerful benchmarking tool for the government, but should be always utilized as a proxy performance indicator. And the table shows this table shows the 14 countries, the highest rating class, very high, in the very high AGDI group. The United States globally continue to play a leading role in government development in America. The Republic of Korea is the global leader in online services provision and is the most advanced performer in Asia, followed by Singapore and Japan. Denmark has the highest GDI value globally for the second consecutive survey. Estonia recorded the most significant GDI increase, and Finland improved in all three sub-indicators. Both Sweden and UK achieved a higher overall GDI value. The Netherlands, Iceland, and Norway showed improvement also in the AGDI. And Australia and New Zealand are the only leading countries from Oceania. As you can see, none of the countries in Africa are included in the highest rating classes. But those 14 countries in the highest rating class should be considered as the global leading countries, no matter their own ranking value or positions. All countries in this rating class demonstrate the consistency in their strategic digital policy areas and in their implementation, there is a trend toward providing a one-stop shop through specialized citizen-centric e-portals where peoples and businesses can access information and data, engage in transaction and legal obligation, and be involved in more participatory governance. Through the use of new te technologies, citizens have the possibility of customizing their own public services and accessing to service delivery with different mobile devices. For these countries, the all of government approach has been strongly institutionalized and supported by data-driven public policies. These countries have a national development strategies that incorporate SDGs objectives and have a national agency department of ministry in charge of a multi-year digital agenda with a chief information officer with the rank of minister, deputy minister or secretary general. All countries in very high rating class have a comprehensive legal and regulatory framework on digital government that rules digital identity, e-procurement, and include legislation on access, safety, and security, freedom of information, and data protection, in line with the principle of effectiveness, efficiency, transparency, accountability, and public trust. These leading countries have a digital by design approach. 
have introduced interoperability to enhance the use of open source solutions and open standards and have implemented the procedures for digitally publishing government expenditures. Let's move now on regional level. This table lists the leading countries in Africa. As you can see, some of them are included in very high uh, AGDI, uh, no, no, sorry, none of them are included in very high AGDI group. Only Mauritius, Seychelles, South Africa, and Tunisia have AGDI value above the global average. Mauritius is the highest rating class for its AGDI group. Next are Seychelles, South Africa, and Tunisia, all of which are one rating class below. It is worthy to note that in 2020, eight countries, Namibia, Capoeira, Egypt, Gabon, Botswana, Kenya, Algeria, and Zimbabwe moved up from the middle to the high AGDI group. The growing number of African countries in the high group show that the region is undergoing a digital transformation. This upward movement in AGDI rankings is driven mainly by the increased investment in infrastructure and online service provision. These mega trends are encouraging for the digitalization of the region. Notwithstanding the notable progress made, the average AGDI value for Africa is far below the global average and the region at a glance continue to face gaps in digital development. The next is about America. The country with the highest AGDI value is, uh, uh, in Americas are shown here. Seven countries are in the very high AGDI group, with the United States in the highest rating class, followed by Uruguay and Canada, one rating class below US, Argentina and Chile, two classes below, Brazil and Costa Rica, three rating classes below. It is worthy to note that Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Costa Rica have moved up for the first time from high to very high AGDI, further reducing the e-government development gap with Northern America. It is also interesting to note that Mexico, Barbados, Colombia, Peru, Bahamas, and Ecuador are in the highest rating class of the high AGDI groups and are thus relatively close to transitioning to the very high AGDI group. Finally, San Lucia, Jamaica, Guatemala, Suriname, and Nicaragua moved from the middle to the high AGDI group. Only Guyana, Belize, Honduras, Cuba, and Haiti remain in the middle AGDI group. Asia increased its average AGDI value by 10%, becoming the second most advanced region in the world in e-government development. Asia has further distinguished itself as the region with the highest number of countries that moved their AGDI rank by more than 15 positions. Why analysts should be cautioned against misinterpreted changes in ranking among countries in the same rating class, significant upward shifts in ranking still serve as a proxy for tracking digital improvement. Countries that experienced great improvement include Bhutan, Cambodia, Syria, China, Armenia, Indonesia, Cyprus, and Thailand. It is worthy to note that for the first time, China, Kuwait, Malaysia, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Thailand, and Turkey joined the group of the very high Asian leaders, raising to 15 the number of countries led by the uh, Republic of Korea, Singapore, and Japan in the highest rating class. And Europe. As a region, Europe has the most uh, homogeneous e-government development. It has, uh, highest, uh, it has the highest uh, average AGDI value. Of uh, the 43 European countries assessed, 33 are in the very high AGDI group, with Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Sweden, UK, Netherlands, Ireland, Norway, in the highest global rating class. Czech Republic, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Latvia, Croatia, Hungary, and Romania moved from high to very high AGDI. In Oceania, five countries are in very high or high AGDI group, and the remaining are in the middle AGDI group. While Australia and New Zealand are the highest world rating class, the other countries in the region have an average AGDI value of 0.44 substantially lower than the global average. In spite of the, this digital divide, 
Fiji, Tonga, and Palau moved up from the middle to the high GDI group, and Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands transitioned from the low to the middle GDI group, showing the ability of the region to move forward with e-government development, even under difficult circumstances. In terms of the e-government development uh, of special groups, the LLDCs, LLDCs and SEEDs are a group, uh, is as a group have increased their average GDI value by 33% uh, since 2016, which is higher than the average global increase of GDI during the same period. Among these three special groups, the LLDCs have made the most progress since 2016, increasing their average GDI value by around 44%. With their transition from the middle to the high GDI group, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Cambodia have become the leaders in the government development among the LDCs, while Lesotho and Cambodia have made significant strides in improving their GDI. LDCs have the lowest average GDI among the three special groups, followed by SIDS and LLDCs. All of these groups have average values below the global average. The leading countries for LLDCs are Kazakhstan, with the second highest award rating class, followed by Armenia, Azerbaijan, and North Macedonia, which are in the high GDI group, but very close of transitioning to the very high GDI groups. It is worthy to mention the digital improvement of Bhutan, Paraguay, and Botswana. For SEEDS, if we exclude the leading countries, Singapore and Bahrain, from the analysis of uh, digital government, the 19 remaining are all in the high GDI groups with an average of GDI that is still below the global average. These results reflect the capacity constraints experienced by these countries as a consequence of their small size, remoteness, and the impact of these constraints on capacity development. Seeds, that have a transition and from the middle to the high GDI groups include Cabo Verde, Saint Lucia, Jamaica, and Suriname. Nonetheless, the average GDI for these special groups remain well below the global average. This gap points the persistent challenges that countries uh, continue to, uh, uh, that continue to undermine the, the efforts for development of the countries in special groups, and in particular, the least developed states. Uh, there are uh, currently 47 LDCs, uh, 33 in Africa, 13 in Asia and Pacific, and one in Latin America. Despite some development gains and investment in technology in several groups of countries, digital divide, continue to persist. If we look at the American region, for example, only four countries out of 54 score higher than the world average. As shown by the red arrows in this slide, the regional average AGDI remains low if compared with the other regional average. At the same time, disparities remain within and among countries. The use of digital technology may create new opportunities for developing countries to bridge the digital divide. However, while developed countries that have existing technological infrastructure experience the benefit of such innovations, many other countries are potentially left behind, adding another dimension to the high uh, to the already widening digital divide. Allow me now to spend the, the last minutes uh, of my presentation to share with you some insight extrapolated from the addendum of COVID-19 uh, response. The pandemic has confirmed that uh, the need for digital transformation and heightened the relevance in advancing e-government development worldwide. It's, um, based on the report, two-thirds of the UN member states have already reached the high level of e-government development. These countries have heavily relied on digital technologies in their pandemic response. <clears throat> During the crisis, many countries uh, focused on uh, uh, provi uh, providing basic information related to general health precaution and emerging number, supported by public announcement and national portal. As the crisis intensified, countries began extending their reach and started using more social media uh, channels. 
at a late stage in the crisis, some governments started using a dedicated COVID-19 portal to centralize information. By the end of the April 2020, nearby 97 uh, percent of UN member states have dedicated COVID-19 portals. Many of them moved further and developed in government, often in partnership with private sector, in designing new services and applied to help in the uh, fight against COVID-19. So let's move to the last uh, uh, slides for a matter of time. Before ending my intervention, a few info about uh, the other parts of the survey not covered by the presentation. The government development is a rising priority in political agenda, also at the local level, as part of 2020 survey processes. Uh, E-government de uh, development were assessed also for 100 cities. This part is covered by chapter four. Participation a key dimension of governments and one of the pillar 2030 agenda. Uh, as for the other survey, chapter five covered the e-participation matter. With the growing technological capacity to process ever larger and more complex data sets, the potential to a more data-centric and data-driven uh, e-government is presented in Chapter 6, and many countries still lack the capacity to leverage digital technology. Development capacity to e-government is essential, as digital government transformation involves far more than the integration of technology. This is covered by Chapter 7. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will also recommend you, if interested, to, move, uh, to attend our webinar series that go more in depth on, uh, on uh, these uh, topics. And with this, I thank you so much, and I leave the floor to the facilitator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aquaro, for this insightful presentation and setting a background for our discussion on e-government trends worldwide. Against this background, I'd like to now invite our first discussant, Islamia Mubayad Bissa, member of the UN Committee of Experts on Public Administration, to share her observation and insight on the findings of the survey. Over to you, Ms. Bissa. Thank you, Ms. Korikian. The launch uh, of the 2020 edition of this e-government survey, 20 years after its inception by both UNDESA and ASPA, has an epic significance in the wake of the pandemic. And this pioneering survey in its vision uh, presented just right now by Vincenzo, the methodologies, the tools, it proved its worth as an annual benchmark for both policymakers and uh, users all around the globe. And a, a young LinkedIn friend, Hen Saud, who I met virtually at the occasion of this launch, told me that she believed in the survey because of the integrity and independence because of trustworthy methodology and evaluation processes. And she put up insightful recommendation that I would happily share with you, Vincenzo, and the team, including her wish to see, as a young woman, digitization in the DNA of the whole of government, as she said it. She shares a passion for digital transformation, for public service, as we all do. And I'm honored also to share this passion with a group of global experts, the SEPA, committee working with DESA on promoting effective governance and institutional reform to accelerate the delivery of the SDG. Uh, we had, uh, as a committee, put up a call to the 2020 HLPF for fast-track reform based on innovative breakthrough, but COVID was faster and it propelled multiple waves of unsuspected technology divides um, the first of which is of a social nature. So um, as we've seen, social value of ICT uh, now uh, revealed more important than ever. The, base, uh, the application they developed on the basis of 5G, AI, cloud, big data, they played a significant role in remote education, in teleworking, in entertainment, in enabling people to resist isolation and to survive the quarantine. The second uh, dividend was on the government side where applications were put up to cope or not in some cases with crushing demands for unemployment benefits, for control of the pandemic, for cautioning economic fallouts, et cetera. And the third dividend was on a public-private side partnership where, where we, we've seen GSMA telecom carriers worldwide play a vital role in unleashing the power 
of connectivity. We've seen that in Africa, where help was extended to uh, um, uh, to uh, schools uh, within a tech for all initiative supported by UNESCO and others. So in short, COVID turned to be a powerful disruptor, much powerful than technology, but definitely an ally to technology. Before COVID, we all thought that investment and digitization is powerful means for transformation, but now we know they, this was going to be very important in the recovery phase. The 2020 survey cannot be timelier in that sense to forecast what it's next and to take, of course, uh, uh, account of the present. And it does that very well, pointing to the power of global collaboration, pointing to political will, to poor infrastructure, to data inclusiveness. Uh, and it, it provides a much, much needed framework for thought for digital government transformation based on the nine key pillars. Um, I am particularly focusing uh, in, in the coming few minutes on the vulnerabilities uh, that are intrinsically linked to this amazing development worldwide, because in some ways it also brought inequalities and within a single society as well as between countries. And here COVID um, uh, made us show, I mean, showed us that in England, for example, four in 10 pupils were not in regular contact with their teachers during the closures. At in USA, which topped the ranks, many children in public schools were missing out on learning. While in Estonia, 87% of schools were already using the e-solution before the crisis and Estonian teachers were trained in digital education and internet. So what vulnerabilities are um, uh, uh, widening and this we should we should be very much concerned and we should rapidly react because while industry is moving to cutting edge connect and compute functionality to supercomputing and all these wonderful world of quantum computing the risks are there and the risks are exacerbated the exclusion risk the unequal concentration of power and wealth uh, and this these if we don't look at them now, our sure recipe for social inability, instability. <clears throat> Government and society, in my view, have together to face this huge challenge at a time when resources are limited, when capacities and capabilities are, are insufficient, and when main challenges that relate to data security, to privacy, to human rights have multifaceted significance. This brings me to my next point, which is um, how we could address these vulnerabilities. And I would like to put forward the 11 principle of effective governance, which we have worked hard at SEPA with DESA on developing. And that constitute, in my view, an opportunity, an opportunity to address these forces of inclusion in the way we conceive and we design digital transformation. Uh, in many countries, um, uh, this will have uh, the operationalization of the principle will have to face also some bureaucrats which do not view citizen as customer or government nor as participant in decision making. And this is why they become more and more important because along with the nine pillars <coughs> presented in the survey, these principles would work, would serve as interesting vehicles for technological technology design based on the three pillars of effectiveness, which comprises competence, health policy making and collaboration on accountability, which comprises integrity, transparency and independent oversight and the principle of leaving no one behind. And third on inclusiveness, which comprises non-discrimination, participation, subsidiarity and intergenerationality. When technology solutions are built on the premise of principles like those, effectiveness by design, accountability by design, inclusion by design, human rights by design, they may become a powerful tool for empowering people to participate in the processes that affect their lives, thus bringing us closer to SDGs and far further away from the basic vulnerability.
capabilities we're talking about. So there is a transformative <coughs> power for these <coughs> technologies here and the use of the principle in service design and in the delivery can be, in my view, intensively pathway toward efficient and inclusive outcomes. Thank you. The third and last part of my remarks um, would uh, uh, bring us to vulnerabilities particular to my region, the region of where I come from, the MENA region, where um, uh, poverty and uh, youth unemployment are exploding after COVID. And the three basic vulnerability I will focus on are trust, one, capacity, second, and peace, third. On trust, I would say that citizens embrace the digital revolution when it is transparent, inclusive, and to the benefit of all. Trust feeds on merit, on accountability of public service, and a belief that everyone, not only the happy few, will reap the rewards of technological progress. And in MENA, a large, expensive, often coercive state apparatus, vulnerabilities are exacerbated. Trust is also a function of transparency, prudence, and accountability in public money management, and technology in MENA would be determinant in reducing malpractices and misuse, which were originally fueled revolutions. On capacity and capability, I would say that it is uh, likely that weak capacity in government in this region will stand in the way of agility, adaptability, and positive transformation in the coming years, and that um, uh, multilaterals and industry would need to step up cooperation in some cases with government, but in other cases with citizen initiatives palliating for government deficiencies. In Lebanon, in particular, uh, two examples. Lebanon, a country facing an unprecedented economic, financial, and governance collapse, youth driven by civic conscious and collaborative spirit acted against the skyrocketing threat of unemployment by yes, creating job, jobs for <clears throat> Lebanon. Sorry to interrupt you. We need to be aware of time. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, my, last, my last vulnerability is on peace, and, and just a reminder that in MENA, uh, this is the world least peaceful region, uh, stage of an unprecedented flow of refugees. Uh, children and youth are today unschooled, one-fifth of them, and they endure recurrent wars and conflict, and this is a vulnerability that will need to uh, come, uh, come, uh, come about with a commitment to peace. I would like to conclude on very three uh, short messages. First, a reminder that uh, betting on technology was right before COVID, and it is so right now, and we've seen that. But the lesson, the greater lesson, is this trust between government and citizen, which make it a sustainable success. The second is a clown day to people whose resilience and value system was put to trial during the pandemic. Of course, the health workers, but also tech people, tech people who did not did a wonderful job in the limelight and still did not receive equal exposure. And lastly, a big thank you to DESA staff, to Vincenzo and experts who worked together under the leadership of Liu Zeyman to his excellent, excellent report. So a big salute. Thank to you. you. Over. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Bissa, for this insightful uh, remarks. Um, I'm now pleased to invite Ms. Julia Gliden, Corporate uh, Vice President for Microsoft Worldwide Public Sector, to share her observations and comments with us. We run a little bit over the time of her. So, Ms. Gliden, we will take a little bit extra um, for you to finish the remarks, but please, please be aware of it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, public sector friends and family from around the world. I'm honored to join you here today to be part of the 20th anniversary of the UN's commitment to helping member states improve e-government service capacity and delivery. Over the past decade, I've had the privilege of working closely on a number of esteemed expert working groups and to see firsthand the way in which the survey's insights, operations and findings have supported governments everywhere in their quest to leave no one behind to deliver services for all, 
and to accelerate achievement of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. I've constantly been impressed by the way in which this survey is regularly updated to reflect new emerging technologies and trends, including the shift toward the term digital government. In this latest, and I must say most beautifully accessible survey, I've been struck by and loved the observation, quote, digital government is not an end, it's a means to ultimately making life better for all. I could not agree more, and I believe this statement underscores the essence of purpose-driven government, a phrase coined by Mohammed J. Sear from EY, which exemplifies our shared sustainable development goals during this decade of action. Government is a platform, multi-channel integration, whole of society, not just whole of government, data and people-centric, not just tech-centric. These are just a few of the trends which caught my eye as I read this year's survey and reflected, reflected on the shift we've seen from simply digitizing the status quo to the goal of delivering sustainable, inclusive, and equitable services to everyone, everywhere. A goal I'm proud to say very much echoes Microsoft's own core mission to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. In this spirit, I was especially pleased to learn from the 2020 survey that today 80% of member states now offer specific digital services for youth, for women, for older people, for persons with disability, for migrants, for the poor. We have much work to do as we've heard throughout the discussion today, but it is truly inspiring to see digital being deployed to help those most in need. I'd be remiss as our discussion today has, re has um, revealed in reflecting on the achievements of digital government over the past 20 years. I did not contextualize these achievements in relation to the current COVID crisis, which predominates all of our discussions. Digital technologies have played an increasing role in helping government address pressing global challenges from managing migration and protecting the environment to helping citizens stay safe and protected. Without a doubt, however, one of the biggest and I would argue most successful tests of digital government has been the way in which it's played a vital role in helping to hold the fabric of civil society together in the face of an unprecedented crisis. When COVID first struck, our CEO Satya Nadella so presciently observed, we are all digital first responders now. Meaning in essence that we in the tech industry are the first responders to the first responders that all of us in tech have a vital role to play in helping to fulfill the public sector mission to ensure the health, education, and safety of people everywhere. I'd like to take a few brief moments here, if I may, to, sh to share some reflections based on my own work throughout the crisis and the way in which technology was able to support the public sector during its hour of need. When the crisis first struck, innovation barriers came down at an unthinkable rate. Satya himself observed that he saw more transformation in two months than in the past two years. A colleague in Sweden observed that he saw his entire country digitized in just seven days. Under the cloud of crisis, the risk of doing nothing outpaced the risk of doing something wrong. Sarah Paquet, EVP for Shared Services Canada, recently shared with me, in the midst of crisis, a planned three-year rollout of remote working was delivered over a weekend in mid-March. It's within this context that we saw cloud, data, and AI come together in new ways to enable governments to keep citizens informed, as we've discussed, to deploy and stay connected with first responders, to empower healthcare workers to deliver virtual assistance. I'd go so far as to say that from the earliest days of the crisis, we saw data, a theme throughout the survey this year, come into its own as a national asset. Taking just one example, around the world, chatbots were rapidly embraced as we learned in real time the way in which they can gather, process, and learn from data to quickly respond to and even resolve inquiries. After this initial phase of the crisis, we then saw agile in action as public sector agencies everywhere rapidly embraced technology to ensure, to ensure continuity of basic operations. In Italy, the Ministry of Justice quickly eased regulation and deployed remote working to enable court cases to proceed without interruptions. 
This is a trend now being adopted by an increasing number of countries, including the Philippines, where leaders praised the way in which technology enabled the legal system to keep operating and innocent people to go free. And of course, education. While there are disparities to address, what could possibly be more important than ensuring that leaders, learners of all ages continue to learn? Around the world, we saw a truly remarkable embrace of remote learning by governments everywhere, including the UAE, which shifted an entire country, 1.3 million learners from classroom to online learning in a matter of weeks. Now, in what we hope is the last and final phase of this crisis, the recovery phase, we're seeing a shift toward whole of society and government as a platform as member states everywhere break down traditional silos, collaborate across government agencies and harness the power of data to deliver social value, whether in the form of distributing funds to help people keep food on the table or searching for much needed COVID treatments and vaccines. We're also seeing innovative new partnerships emerge to address the vital need for new capacities and skills in the post-COVID era. LinkedIn, GitHub, and Microsoft, for example, have come together to help 25 million students and workers prepare for the future of work. From the printing press to email, from paper to websites, from queuing to immediate resolution, despite the work that still needs to be done, 20 years of UN benchmarking shows that governments have always been shaped by advances in technology. Thanks to the successful delivery of countless digital services during the COVID crisis, it's fair to say that new and emerging technologies are in the process of driving another fundamental shift in the way the whole of government works. With public sector more open than ever before to embracing new methodologies like agile, new tools like data, and new uh, technologies like cloud and AI, I truly believe that the future has never been brighter for digital government. It's worth repeating UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez's um, comments. The post COVID-19 world will be different and much more digital than before. It is now up to us all to come together to embrace the combined power of human innovation and technology during this, the UN decade of action to harness the full promise and potential of digital to deliver public services that are truly sustainable, truly inclusive, and truly available to all. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you here today. Thank you so much, Ms. Glidden, for your observations and comments. Uh, with this, I'd like to give the floor back to the Under Secretary General, Mr. Liu Zhenmin, for his closing remarks. Thank you, Apan, for moderating this luncheon session. Um, like, let me start to thank you, my colleagues, uh, uh, Vincenzo and the two discussions, uh, Lamia and uh, Julia, for their, uh, for their contribution to this discussion. Uh, I'm so delighted to be seeing to be, uh, this luncheon has really received uh, wide attention from the globe. I think I highly appreciate the, 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 the appreciation given by our two discussions. Really, this is unique. Uh, UN e-government survey is a unique publication, founded by DESA, but supported by uh, UN agencies. I think, let me make a few brief points. Uh, the current pandemic and the global crisis really are reminded governments at the regional, national, and the local governments had reminded them the importance of improving the e-governance. I think people all realize that without e-government, without the digital service, nobody knows how we are going to survive over the past five months in governance, in service. I think uh, th that's why I think it'll be really, uh, we, we, we are confronted global crisis, but this crisis also offered an important opportunity for the improvement of e-governance. Second, I think that because this crisis also reveals that the, uh, the, the, the digital divide really the, remains an important challenge, both for within countries and among countries. I think uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals, actually one of the objectives for the United Nations 
uh, to help member states to achieve their e-governance. I think SG16, we will achieve SG16 by 2030. They, one of our objectives to achieve that the e-governance would be definitely and globally improved, uh, even where, with, with various levels. But I think that, that's why we, we believe that be, 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 we need, in the coming decade, we need to also continue to address the, the, these challenges both within countries and among the countries. Third, I want to also to highlight, to, 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 uh, to complement to the remarks by my colleague, Vicenzo, uh, where he, he, he did, uh, commented on the, this uh, the, the mega trends for, for the rank, rank, ranking. I think it'd be really, we so delighted to see that it'd be the, the, the very positive the, the evolution over the past two years in the e-governance. But I want to also clarify that we have this ranking, not just for the sake of ranking. We're trying to really uh, to, to demonstrate to the member states, to the public, that the, through the ranking, how their e-government have been improved from uh, the improving their infrastructure, for improving their online service, and for improving their human development. So it's, 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 it's I think that we, we're so delighted to think be, uh, though the e-government level always connected with the overall their development level. That's why you can see that uh, the developed economies normally have a much better and higher level of the e-governance. But we are so glad to say that even the majority of the developing countries, they are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are making good progress. I think for this survey, a number of developing countries, they have joined, moved up from the levels, from high level to very high, from middle level to the high level. Of course, there'll be very few countries that will be downgraded. But I think there'll be, there'll be all countries will learn something from this survey and to find some experiences in improving the e-government. So, dear colleagues, I think be, this is the luncheon trying to explain and help the public to understand this publication. But I hope that be, all, all the colleagues will find some interesting points in this survey. I hope this survey really will contribute to the governments in improving your e-governance and with a final objective that would contribute to achieving a sustainable development. So I want to thank all the colleagues who have been contributing to, to the preparation of this uh, e-government e survey. And also for all colleagues who, who have been joined this luncheon lunch session. I uh, thank you, go. I uh, thank you all. Wish you have a very nice day. Thank you. I wish you have a very nice weekend. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Under Secretary General. Thank you very much for um, the presenters as well and the discussions for their valuable contribution. With this, um, I'd like to announce this meeting adjourned. Uh, the recording of the meeting will be available on UN Web TV as well as on the Facebook face, uh, Live. You can follow the uh, questions there. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful work. Thank okay. you so much. So I hope we will continue. Thank you all. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Apa. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.